I suspect if I were to get on the street corner of Oklahoma City, now they might lock me up for being a strange fellow, but if I began to ask people if they believed in Jesus, most people would say, surely I do. And most people would have little clue as to who he is. And they wouldn't understand that much about what it meant to believe in Jesus. And my subject tonight is, what does it mean to believe in Jesus? And I take you to a familiar text and one that will be a grand beginning illustration of what we want to talk about in the fifth chapter of the Gospel of Luke. The occasion is one in which Jesus has taught on the beach, well, it's not exactly a sandy beach around Galilee, but he has been teaching the people. And many had stood there and listened to him. And he saw, we are told, two boats, verse 2, standing by the lake. Fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. And he got into one of the boats, and it happened to be Simon Peter's. And he sat down and taught the people from that boat. The sea made a wonderful sounding board. We often wonder how all those huge crowds could hear Jesus so clearly. Well, it was echoed from the surface of the water. And when he had finished his discourse, he said to Peter a strange thing. He said, put this boat out into the deep water and let down the nets to take a catch of fish. Well, Peter has fished all night, and he is tired. It's time to go home and go to bed. The nets are washed and laid aside. But Jesus has said to him, you go out in the water and let down the nets to catch fish. He has fished all night, as he will tell the Lord, and has caught nothing. And he is a professional fisherman. And all that he knows about that lake and about fishing in that lake, all that he knows about the whole profession of fishing, tells him there are not any fish here to be caught. He has a challenge, this fisherman does. Whether he is going to listen to his instincts, to his experiences, to his knowledge of fishing, or the voice of somebody who is not a fisherman, but a carpenter. Now, I'm going to imitate PowerPoint tonight. I am a very low-tech preacher. I think PowerPoint is wonderful, and I watch others use it with great effectiveness but it's not my cup of tea. I don't like it because if I see I need to change directions in the middle of a sermon, it's too late because it's all fixed and we can't do that. Well, that's another story. But radio was always more powerful than television because people had to use their imagination. I want you to use your imagination here. Over here, and there's that huge screen that you can look at, I want you to notice uh, something like this, a symbol that circles and then folds into itself with an arrow pointing inside. That is what I want you to understand is subjective faith. As you hear something, as you experience something, immediately everything goes inside to be vetted by, to be examined by, to be carefully observed by what you know and what you feel and what you think about things. That was Peter's temptation. Well, you've got that picture, haven't you? You won't be able to forget it even after this sermon is over. But over here, here's another illustration, a similar circle that the arrow goes up. And that is objective faith. 
And it was between those two that Peter was caught as he was told by the Lord, get out in the water and let's catch some fish. As I have said, all that he knew said there are no fish out there. But then this is the Son of God who's speaking. This is the one who can, he has confessed to be God's Son, the Redeemer of Israel. This is the one who's, whom he has confessed to be divine, the Son of the living God. And that one says, you go out in this boat and let down the nets for a catch. And the scripture says that he, ha having mentioned all these ideas that came to his mind, said that at your word, we will do it. Now, a lot of people would have thought Peter was just absolutely a mother goose mentality listening to anybody that came along telling him how to run his business. People think that about me sometimes. Then I read the language of Jesus in the Scripture, and I read the language of the apostles that he sent out, and I conclude that that is how things are. And someone says, can't you think for yourself at all? Well, I believe I can. I wrestled with this question a long time ago. Who is Jesus? That is the critical question that faces this generation as it has faced all generations. Who is he? As he asked later, he asked the disciples at Caesarea Philippi, who do you say that I am? And he's asking men who have already confessed him. But he has something to tell them that he knows is going to be a tremendous shock that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer and die. And he wants them to say again, who do you say that I am? This is the one that I came to believe was the Christ of God. I examined the evidence, and I did it increasingly as I proceeded from the first confession that I made as a young man. And when I decided that Jesus was the Christ, I decided that whatever he said, that's how it was. And that every question that I would ever entertain as a Christian was potentially answered then. Whatever he thought about it, whatever he said about it, and whatever those he sent to speak for him said about it, that was the way it was. Now you can think of me as a sort of an easy fellow. But that's where the intellect must be engaged. Here is the testimony. A good friend of mine, Tom Moody, debated an atheist in Louisville, Kentucky, many years ago. And he debated the issue of, is there a God on the basis of whether Jesus was raised from the dead? And so the whole thing was focused on the resurrection of Jesus. I thought it was a rather clever approach. Because if Jesus was raised from the dead, then he is exactly who he claimed to be. And if he is the Son of God, then there is a God. And the advantage to that particular proposition was that it contained a historical event that was subject to proof by historical evidence. And that's exactly where John puts it, isn't it, in John 20, 30, and 31. Many other signs truly to Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing you may have life in his name. Evidence is offered to us. It's not overwhelming. It doesn't send us with our brains shattered in absolute submission because we cannot even raise a question about it, but it's powerful evidence that we must wrestle with. And so, that's where I am tonight. The Bible gives us an example of these two kinds of faith, subjective, looking inside, resting our decision upon our experience and what we've heard and the cultural uh, impact that we have had, or looking up to a standard that is beyond ourselves, to God, the unchanging God. Well, you remember the story of 
Naaman in the fifth chapter of 2 Kings. Interesting fellow. He was the commander of the armies of Syria, which gave no little misery to the people of Israel. He had won victory after victory. He had the absolute confidence of the king of Syria. But there was a tragedy in his life that he could not conceal, and that was this. He was a leper. In the course of his raids into Israel, he had taken captive a little Jewish girl who had become an attendant upon his wife. And I have to say that young lady was remarkable. I don't think I would have been too kindly disposed toward the people that snatched me out of my home in the middle of the night and took me away and made me a servant, a slave. But she whispered into the ear of her, of her mistress that if his, her master knew about the prophet in Israel, he could go there and be healed of his leprosy. Well, the message went up to Naaman. And Naaman consulted the king of Syria, and the king of Syria, in his great wisdom, decided that the way to get this done is to send a message to the king of Judah and ask him to heal Naaman's leprosy. Well, when Naaman got there with his request, the king was, was absolutely startled and distressed because he said to himself, the king of Syria just wants to fight, and he's asked me to do some impossible thing, and when I can't do it, he will say, well, it's time to go to battle. But Elisha, the prophet of God, heard about how the king had torn his clothes in distress and sent word up there, you send him down to me. And so he came with his chariot, Ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten changes of raiment. He was ready to reward anybody who could take away his leprosy. And he came, as the record tells us, you can read for yourself there in the fifth chapter of Second Kings. He came to the home of the prophet, and the prophet didn't even bother to come to the door. I mean, this is the commander of the armies of Syria with all the attendant power and honor that's associated with it, and the prophet doesn't even come to the door, but sends out his servant who says an unthinkable and silly thing. He says, you tell him to go dip seven times in the river Jordan, and he will be cleansed. And Naaman was livid. And he said the obvious. He said, we've got better rivers than this back in Syria, the Abana and Farfar. I didn't need to come down to this muddy Jordan to, to, to find water to be healed of leprosy. And he left in a rage. That's subjective faith. Naaman said, for all, from all my experience, this is preposterous. And I've wasted my time coming down here. And I've been treated with short shrift by the man who should have come out because it was my image of things. I could see it before it happened that he would come out and strike his hand over the place and the leper would be healed. And it didn't happen that way. Well, his servant, maybe when Naaman's anger was cooling, I think I would have waited a bit because the man has got your throat in his power, and I, I, I wouldn't want to be offensive in any way. He said, uh, you know, if he had asked you to do some great thing, wouldn't you have done that? And Naaman turned from that kind of subjective faith in himself to realize that he was in desperate straits, that he didn't want to live the rest of his life as a leper, and he was being offered an opportunity to be thoroughly cleansed, and he went and did exactly what the prophet said and dipped seven times in the Jordan, 
and came up with his skin as clean as a child's. Objective faith. He did what he was told. He didn't reason that this ought to have been done differently. He didn't have his own agenda. And I will, I will tell you, and I say this with great kindness here tonight, beloved, don't come to God with your own agenda. It doesn't make sense. He is God, the infinite, limitless God. And not only that, what we learned about Him is not only that He has limitless power and limitless knowledge and that He is infinitely righteous, but He is infinitely gracious and merciful and that His intentions toward us are in every way for our good. So whatever He says, that's the intention. Well, there's an illustration in the case of Abraham. There is no more remarkable scene than the 22nd chapter of Genesis when Abraham is told by God one day, and he's not young anymore. Sarah had a child when she was 90, and the child that was promised took a long while. Didn't happen. And he's a lad now, born when Abraham was a hundred, and he was dear to his father and to his mother, to say the least. And God said to him the unthinkable. He said, I want you to take Isaac, your only son, to the mountains of Moriah, and I want you to offer him there as a burnt offering. I cannot imagine what went through Abraham's mind. This was a moral challenge. How will I take the life of this young man? It was an emotional challenge. How will I take the life of my only son? It was a, ra it was a rational challenge. It was a logistic challenge. It, 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 it's the question of, if I do this, how will God's promise to me to be the father of a great nation ever be fulfilled? Took him three days to get there. He had a lot of time to think about this. But let me suggest some questions that we might ask Abraham while he was on the way to Mount Moriah. Uh, wait a minute. Uh, where are you going, Abraham? Well, I'm going down to the mountains of Moriah. Well, what are you going to do when you get there? He said, I'm going to offer my son as a burnt offering. You're going to do what? Is this not the child that God promised you? Is it not the child that God promised you would be the heir that you had long awaited, the son of Sarah? And if you do this, how will you become the father of a great nation? You know what I think he would have said? I don't know. I don't know. He was looking up. Had he looked within, had that been the determining feature of his decision, he could not have done this. And I can tell you, I don't think that there was any greater challenge to faith in all the Old Testament literature than this was. It's interesting what was written in that 22nd chapter of Genesis, and you don't always pick up on it, but the writer of James, or the writer of Hebrews, and Hebrews 11 did. Abraham said to his young lads, he said, you stay here with the animal, and the lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we, do you notice that? And we will come again to you. The writer of Hebrews says that Abraham believed that God would raise him from the dead. I don't know if Abraham thought that's exactly what's going to happen, but I will tell you his disposition was, it's my responsibility to do what God asked me to do, and it's God's task to fulfill His promises. Oh, we need a faith like that. To quit acting like we're creators. 
To quit acting as though we have such an immense mind that we can take hold of all that God knows and somehow digest it ourselves and make the decision for ourselves. That would be like pouring Niagara Falls into a teacup. It cannot be done. We're going to be redeemed by faith. And it will be an objective faith that reaches up to God and listens to what He has to say and responds, Speak, Lord, your servant hears, command, and I will obey. Uh, well, how do you develop a faith like that? Well, you, you've got to develop that attitude that Peter had, at your word. At your word, we will do that. Of course, you know the story that when they brought up the nets, the nets were breaking. He hadn't seen such a catch of fish in all his life, and he was so startled by this miracle, which happened in his own backyard, that he fell at the Lord's feet and said, Depart from me, O Lord, I'm a sinful man. But that's the key. Uh, somebody says, have you, read, have you read the first three chapters of Genesis? Uh, well, yes, I've read that a time or two. Well, have you read there what it says? That God created a set in order the world in six days? Do you believe that? Uh, yes, I do. Well, why do you believe that? You know, you know what the scientists are saying. Don't you understand what insightful men, men who have made large studies of this particular subject, are saying about that? Don't you understand what they say at Harvard and Yale? Don't you know what they say at Oxford and Cambridge? Don't you know what they're saying at the University of Oklahoma and even Oklahoma State or at Texas University or down there with the Aggies? Well, they're saying that this is not possible. This is not what happened. I know that. But I also know that at none of those institutions do they know the answer to life's most important question? And that is, what is the purpose of life and why we are here? And what is the expectation of us and where are we going? Why then do you believe those things? Because Jesus did. And I believe in Jesus. That story about Adam and Eve that is rather laughed at by many. Jesus refers to in the 19th chapter of Matthew, verse 3. When asked by the Pharisees, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? He said, have you not read? I mean, Jesus took them back to the Scripture because he held the Scripture in high honor. Have you not read that he that made them in the beginning made them male and female and said for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife? and they too should become one flesh, and then he adds the necessary implication of that statement, what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. Jesus believed in that story. And because he does, I do. And you say, well, how can you work it out? If you, uh, that's God's business. Well, surely you don't believe in that big flood story. Surely you don't believe that. That the world was covered with water. And that Noah and his family, lifted up by the ark which God instructed him to build, were carried, they were carried to a pristine world. You don't believe that story. I do. Why, why do you believe that? Because Jesus did. 24th chapter of Matthew. Jesus speaking about his own second coming, beginning verse 37. But as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, and the day, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. I don't think the Lord ever said just exactly like Goldilocks and the three bears and all that sort of thing. That's exactly how it's going to be when I do this or that. That's the reason I believe that. 
And the whole issue is, who is Jesus? That is the determining question. Well, he, somebody says, I know you don't believe that fish story in the book of Jonah. Yes, I do. I do believe that. Well, you can't believe that because, you know, a, a fish couldn't swallow a man and a man couldn't live in that kind of atmosphere and be vomited up on the, on the shore and, and be in such a state that he'd go and walk 40 days to the city of Nineveh preaching to those people about their sins. You know that can't be so. It's all sort of a, you know, a myth and it has some purpose. No, I believe it happened. Why do I believe it happened? Because Jesus believed that it happened. Matthew chapter 12, when the Jews were requesting a sign from him, and he had had about all he wanted of that kind of request, because the kind of sign they wanted was some gargantuan, carnal demonstration of his Philistine power so that they could know that they were going to really get a true kingdom so that the force of it would just blast away all their enemies and exalt them to the position of eminence they figured they deserved and had deserved for a long time. Matthew 12, verse 40, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Do you believe in Jesus? What do you think it means to believe in Jesus? Can you imagine Peter saying, Lord, I believe in you. I really do, but I ain't going to put this boat out in that water when I know there are not any fish out there and we're wasting our time. I love you, but. Can you imagine Abraham saying when he's instructed to take his only son out and offer him as a burnt offering, saying, well, you know, Lord, I've been following you a long time and I've stayed with you through a lot of tough, difficult days. I left Ur of the Chaldees where we had running water and an urban society and all the niceties of the city life to come down here and run around this barren stretch of land that I didn't even get a chance to look at before you told me to go down there. And I, I was with all that, but this is too much. I, I, I can't do this. I believe in you, but I can't do this. Well, here's where it is. Luke chapter 24. What is your attitude toward the Scripture? What is your attitude toward the Scripture? The Old Testament Scripture. The records that are given there, not, not as metaphors, not as obviously figurative things, but literal historical records. That is how they come to us. Jesus after his resurrection, met those two men walking along the road to Emmaus, downcast, their world crushing to its end, and he engages them in conversation. And finally, Jesus says to them, after they have decided it's all over, in verse 25 of that chapter, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to, enter, to have entered into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the thing concerning himself. You believe in Jesus? Do you believe what Jesus believed about God's word? That's how it is. And in the same chapter, verse 44, then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. All things. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the Scriptures. My attitude toward the Old Testament is exactly the attitude that Jesus had because I believe that Jesus was the Son of God and the Christ of God. So I hold those scriptures to be inspired of God. I hold those scriptures to be properly understood when they're understood as they were intended to be understood, in context. And if I decided I did not believe that, 
and you can decide you're not going to accept all that stuff. You can decide that you're not going to accept what the Old Testament Scriptures have said, but let me tell you this, and again, in all kindness, you can never say after that that you believe in Jesus Christ because you do not believe what he believed. It seems to me that that sort of gets things down to what we say as brass tacks. What does it mean to believe in Jesus? It means that when he says something, that's the way it is. When he promises something, that's the way it is. When he tells us what to do, that's exactly what we do. And we don't find ourselves having abandoned our mind and committed intellectual suicide as a consequence of that. We have decided on the basis of evidence that he is the son of the living God. And as a consequence of that, we believe what he said. Now, if we don't believe what he said, then we don't believe he's the son of God. No sense continuing the fiction. It demands humility to take this approach. A humility that submits one's thinking to God and rejects what I might think about it and what I might suppose about it and what wise people of our own age and generation might think about it and accepts the word of the living God expressed in his Son. And thirdly, it requires that we become fools in this world. The Apostle Paul wrote some wonderful things in the first three chapters of 1 Corinthians. And he said about the gospel that it was foolishness to the Greeks. He knew that. The gospel is still foolishness to this generation. Oh, I know we have a lot of cultural Christians. Cultural Christians are Christians that like Christianity because they think it helps them. And if it's Buddhism that helps you, welcome to it. That's just as true as the gospel is. And if it's Hinduism that be, is, a, is a blessing to you, then take it. That's the postmodern attitude toward so-called Christianity. But the Christianity, the way of Christ that's recorded in this book, which is the only one that exists, the rest is myth. The rest is just your idea, your notion about this thing. You have created an idol, a Jesus that was never preached by the apostles, a Jesus that was never described by the gospel writers. And so you're worshiping an idol, something of your own creation. But if you want the true Christ who really exists and who's able to save you from your sins, then he's here in this book. And if people think we're crazy because of that, so be it. We'll become fools for Christ's sake, as the Apostle Paul said. For to us who have been saved, he is not weakness but strength. He is not foolishness but wisdom. So when we think about what we're going to do about our relationship to God, Jesus has been rather explicit about that, and I think rather simple in his directions. John 8, 24, except you believe that I am he, and of course that means commitment, doesn't it? You will die in your sins. He does not allow other ways, other systems. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one will come to the Father except by him, John 14, verse 6. We say that without hesitation because we believe he is the Son of God. And then, of course, he charges us to understand that faith means we change. You, I try to help people understand that God didn't just come into the world, send His Son into the world so we can be forgiven. He didn't just come so our sins could be remitted. He came so we could be transformed. So that it's not just a matter of saying one day, sure, I believe in Jesus. The day you say that Jesus Christ is Lord, you have committed everything you have or ever hoped to be to His keeping. And you don't call the shots anymore. That's what He's asking from us. Let them think we're fools. If Jesus really is the Christ, we are no fools. And our trust in Him is not foolishness at all but wisdom. And that consummating expression of obedience to Him, coming into Him, entering into a relationship with the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, that is an expression of a penitent faith. And in the final analysis, all it is is just believing. 
is that we are buried with him by baptism into death, Romans 6, verse 4. That like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we also should walk. Notice that, walk, in newness of life. A friend of mine has been known to say that some people are not dead enough to bury. <laughs> we have to die to that old person. We are done with him, and now we live in Christ. I am crucified with Christ, Paul says. It's no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. That's what I wanted to say to you tonight. Do you believe in Jesus? We're going to sing a hymn that we frequently sing, and I'm not sure we mean it as much as we ought. I surrender all. If you are lost tonight, undone, without hope, apart from God, it's God who is appealing to you to come. And how can you resist his earnest invitation? And as we conclude this lesson here tonight, I'm asking you, do you believe in Jesus? And if you really believe in him, are you willing to do whatever he says? And do you know what that is? And wouldn't this be a grand time to, like, to make life's most transforming decision? We urge it upon you while we stand together and sing.